today is taken from Isaiah chapter 8, starting at verse 19, is on page 693 of your church Bibles, or also on the screen. When men tell you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. Distressed and hungry, they will roam through the land. When they are famished, they will become enraged, and looking upward will curse their king and their God. Then they will look towards earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom, and they will be thrust into utter darkness. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future he will honour Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. <coughs> For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Let's pray and uh, ask for God's help as we spend time together in his word. Gracious Lord, we ask that you would, by your Spirit's power working through your word, speak to us more clearly of yourself that we might know you better, we might walk in your ways, and turn to you once again for your name's sake. Amen. All sorts of things are forecast every day. We um, you know, go on, uh, either you watch the, the, the weather forecast or you load it up on your app on your phone and you largely see how wrong the BBC or Met Office will get it. Uh, how, where will it be, when will it rain, etc. There are other sorts of forecasts that we have. We have economic forecasts which again is largely intelligent people stabbing in the dark, as far as I can tell. Uh, alongside that you have um, the bookies, they, they make forecasts about who they think will win uh, various things, whether it be horses with four legs or men with two. Uh, either way round, uh, trying to guess what the future will be. Uh, but what about the world and the way in which it is heading? Are you positive for the world? You know, will defeat global warming, will reduce or, or end all war, will end poverty and bring about equality for all. Or maybe you're more negative and realise that the world will continue to be selfish. We will be surrounded by war. Global warming will overtake us and there will be ongoing economic hardship. But what if I asked you why you thought that? Now, what is it, what evidence would we have to help us read the world and where it's heading? About whether it's positive or negative. What gives you that impression for that forecast? Is it the news channels or the newspapers? Is it what we read on social media? Is it, because you're particularly intelligent, research papers that you read about all sorts of things? Or is it um, the Jeremy Vine phone-in with the sort of level of debate that goes on there? Now, let me be clear, I'm not assuming that everyone here this morning is a Christian. We have visitors every week, uh, or, or maybe you're a regular and you're still not sure if you're a Christian. It's great that you're with us. And uh, what I want us to do this morning, though, is to see 
how the Christian should view the world, to help us see why it is glorious, and so what we should do about it. Which means that if we're a Christian, there is an encouragement for us to keep going. And if you're not a Christian, it's an invitation to hear from God and what he offers to us all. Our reading from Isaiah 9 began with darkness, the people walking in darkness. As this is written, this is 700 years before Jesus would be born. And uh, the nation of Israel, God's people, are surrounded and besieged. You can read the story in 2 Kings uh, 16, 17 and 18. And you've got the kings of Aram and Syria uh, to the north. And you have Egypt to the south and the kingdom of Assyria, and with King Tiglath-Pileser III, the third, I'll have you know, King Tiglath-Pileser, the threat of war is very real. They are surrounded by powerful nations. Naphtali and Zebulun that are mentioned uh, in verse 1 are, I suppose, are on the front line of, of um, the, the enemies. They are surrounded, people regularly would go in and raid, and take from them. I suppose they're sort of the doormat as the uh, invaders would come on through. God's people had a series of unfaithful kings who were self-serving, and that's just the political world. But on the ground, the result would be that the people were just about managing. Life was difficult, with threat of terror, financial hardship, plus all the experiences of life that bring ups and downs. In fact, such is the darkness that is described as deep darkness. It is described as the shadow of death in verse 2. Such trouble that it casts a death-like shadow. So with all those circumstances all around them, what were God's people to think of their future? How would they know what to think about their future? And what would speak to them? Well, this is what chapter 8, verses 19 to 22 say. When men take to console mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, then they have no light of dawn. Now, now let's be clear, God's and people, the situation isn't going to change overnight. It's not like situation in life is going to be all brightness. But the instruction is to come to God's instruction and warning. That is, come back to the law, come back to his word, to reorder their lives into the way they're supposed to. The word was, was full of warnings if they had turned away from God, and they had done exactly that. But without coming back to the word of God... There is no light of dawn. They will not see the light. It will bring about a spiritual hunger. They'll become enraged and distressed. There'll be darkness and fearful gloom. And not only is their situation difficult, but they won't see a future. That is without inquiring of God and seeking him in the word of God. There is darkness, only doom. And yet... Look at the promise of God as they come to his word. Into the darkness of their situation, God promises light. He says there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. There will be no more gloom. They will go from being humbled to being honoured. They will go from darkness to light. Why? Because of the promise that God makes about the future. Because of what he says, and of how he sees the world, and how he sees the future, and therefore what he promises his people, and therefore us. Light comes into the dark world as they come to the light of the promises of God's word. What is the promise? Verse 4. For as in the day of Midian's defeat... You have shattered the yoke of burdens and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Now you might be there this morning going, what on earth is that about? Well, Midian is one of the great stories of the Old Testament. You can go back to Judges 6 and 7. The Midianites and throughout the Old Testament are, are at war with God's people. 
But at this particular point, the Midianites, and every time God's people and, uh, planted harvests, uh, planted crops, uh, the harvest would come, and the people of Midian would come, and they were described like swarms of locusts would come and destroy the harvest. So they're invaded, and everything was ruined and destroyed. Their livestock would be taken away. There were so many of them, you couldn't count them. So imagine being one of God's people in those days, uh, when the Midianites were coming. The news reports have been hopeless. Disaster was coming. Uh, how would they eat? Now, of course, we've probably become even more aware of it in recent, uh, recent months uh, with the war in Ukraine. As, uh, as, the, as the grain is destroyed or can't be shipped out, then our food prices have gone up. It's impacted us miles away. And it's going to leave all sorts of people in all sorts of poverty and famine. But God... Through the judge Gideon, promised rescue. Now, it really was quite serious because the army were told, if you're afraid, you can go home. And so 22,500 did. That's how certain they were that they were going to get walloped. They abandoned their post. And in the end, God whittles the army down to 300 people. And yet they were victorious. And just as against the odds God brought about victory, he says uh, that it's exactly the same thing going to happen again. For as in the day of Midians, you have shattered that word. And notice again, it's in the past tense. Even though it hasn't yet happened, it's as good as done because God has said it will happen. God is promising victory. Verse 5, and light comes because war is over. Every warrior's boot used in battle uh, and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning. We fuel for the fire. You won't need that stuff anymore. And so you can use it to heat your home. You don't need it. Because war is over. The yoke, the burdens of life will be shattered. The rod of the oppressor will be dealt with. Imagine the good news that, that would be to God's people then. Light, hope. And as verse 3 says, they are now full of joy because of this peace. But how can God promise peace in those circumstances. Well, verse 6. For to us the son is born. To us the son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. They can be certain of rescue because a child is born. Our burdens are lifted from his shoulders as he reigns. God's answer to everything that has ever terrorized the world is a baby. What is he like? Well, he's the wonderful counselor. Uh, counselor as in uh, wisdom. Uh, but wonderful, you might feel a bit weak, but, but wonderful is, is almost always a word used in the Old Testament to describe the works and actions of God. So there was a, a lady called Sarah who was uh, married to Abraham, and, and she did not have a child. She was in her 80s, and God said, you will have a child. And she'd been longing for this child. And so when she was told she would have one, she laughed. I mean, it was genuinely hilarious, the idea that an 80-year-old lady would have a child. And even up to 90, she still didn't have one. But as she laughed, God said, is anything too wonderful for God? God is able to do that. This is divine wisdom. He's only the mighty God. It all, it's all very well having a wisdom to know what to do, but here is one who will have the power to do it, to ensure the liberation and rescue. He'll be an eternal father. Uh, that is, so often um, people, unfortunately usually not in most helpful context, describe themselves as the father of the nation. Usually if someone describes themselves as the father of the nation, you need to be warned because they're usually a dictator. Uh, but the point is that they're trying to say that we're all part of a family together. And here we have an eternal father. He's not just a king, not just a ruler, but head of the household. The person that each of us can come to. And he is one that is good and will last for eternity. But he's also the prince of peace. At least he's in the kingly line. He's the one that will bring peace at last. And that is, they can be at peace. They can be no anxiety. There'll be harmony in relationships. And imagine what this does for God's people. It instantly brings rest. And the promise of verse 7 is of the increase of his government peace, there will be no end. 
He will reign on David's throne over his kingdom, establishing, upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. His rule will cover all the earth for all time. And so will no justice and righteousness, no more corruption, no more self-seeking, uh, nothing unfair, nothing evil or wrong. In fact, the peace will spread and spread. And the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. That is his power, his might, his entire determination is to bring this about. This isn't just the end of a war, but the end of all war. Eternal peace, eternal security. But remember the situation that God's people found themselves in. Surrounded and in fear. And yet God promises the impossible, a rescue. He promises that how we often see the world is not the way that he sees the world. The people of God then would have to decide whether they're going to read their experiences by what they could see in front of them or whether they were going to look into the word of God, into the promise that he made, and would they trust him for the future? Would they gain hope from God's actions in the past and trust and have hope for the future? Because God's forecast is very different from theirs. And so Isaiah puts the promise and hope of these verses right next to the reality of the darkness in which God's people are living in. Not because relief will immediately happen, but because the eyes of faith, it is immediately evident. Think of, uh, I wonder if you ever like going out for early morning walks. Uh, maybe you've got a dog and it barks at you and so therefore you uh, sort of get up in the morning and, and off you go for an early morning walk. Uh, and as you walk, the, the sun begins to rise. And as it rises in the east, it is a promise of a brand new day. And just as God makes his promise, it is a promise uh, that we can see the light, that can be sustained by hope, but it is sure and certain. And what God's word says then is what he says to us today. And yet the promise is even greater because it's not just for uh, his remnant of a people, but it is for all people and for all time. Because just as they experience darkness, so do we. There is the threat of terror and financial hardship, of pressures at work and of at home, of lack of peace and sense of disquiet in our own lives. They are our experiences. And God's word says, to us, a child is born. To us, to you, a son is given. But the danger is, we'll not seek God. Maybe we've been involved in mediums and, and spiritualists and, and try and find out information from them. And they're always being advertised on Facebook around here. Uh, but there are other ideologies too. Other ways of seeing the world that ultimately will only bring darkness and gloom. And the ideology that through human effort we can bring about world peace, yes, we must thrive to do so, but we will fail. And when we do, we'll despair. And the idea that we'll beat every disease and illness, yes, let's do all we can to treat these things, but we will never escape death. There will always be funerals and there will always be grief. The idea that politics or anything can bring about uh, entire justice and fairness in our world, yes, we must strive for those things, but we can never truly achieve it. It will only bring about the gloom that Isaiah speaks of. So what will end all suffering, all injustice and strife? What will bring us eternal peace? To us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. We have a mighty ruler who brings eternal relief, eternal joy and peace, of which there will be no end. And we have this hope even more certain. Because not only did God bring about relief for God's people in Midian, he then would do it for God's people then. Read 1 Kings 18 about how an entire army is wiped out by God. But it's made even more certain. Because not only have we seen those things, but also because the child that was promised was then born. He was born that first Christmas, his own son, Jesus Christ. And he comes as the one that brings peace. 
The peace that ends all chaos and all suffering, uh, all things that bring tension and fear and disharmony. It, it means there's no more guilt or shame. He is the one who is truly the wonderful counselor, who offers each of us real wisdom, who is the mighty God who is able to bring it about. The burdens on our shoulders is lifted as the government goes on to his. Jesus himself would say, come to me, all that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He offers to take our burdens on himself. Don't we long for that peace? Maybe you're here this morning with various hurts and pain. Maybe you're here with a mountainous burden, a weight that you can't shift, and maybe the future looks bleak. As it was then, so now. Let us look to God's word and the promise that he's made to all of us. The promise of light and of hope and of peace. And let us find it in that child that was born. Who one day will take us to all eternity. But as we close, as we come to him, what does he say to us? What does this wonderful counsellor say? And I'd love you to pick up your Bible again and, and turn to Matthew chapter 4. Which you can find on page 968. Of the church Bibles. Because Jesus finds that John has been put in prison, he returns to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in, the, in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, which of course came up in Isaiah 9. And this was to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Uh, and uh, Matthew wants to see very clearly that Jesus is doing this to say that Isaiah 9 is about Jesus. He says, land of Nab Nebulin and land of Naphtali, to the way of the sea along the Jordan, the galley of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of shadow death, a light has dawned. The point that Matthew is making is that they have literally seen the light. It's not just the promises of God's word, but here is God's word himself. They have seen the one who will bring this about. He says, here he is, he's bringing the light into the world. And then Jesus, verse 17, begins to preach. And what does he preach? Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is near. The kingdom he offers is one of wisdom, one of peace, of relief, of joy, for all eternity. And what is the way into that kingdom? Well, it is coming. Advent is a time in which we remember that not only did Jesus come once, but he will return and his kingdom will be established for all eternity. And the entrance is to repent. Repent. And that's just a fancy Bible word that means turn away. Turn back from the things that we have done that is wrong. Say sorry for those things and come back to God. Come back to his word and come back to his promise. And come back to him. Trust in him. The kingdom of this king who will bring about peace is near. It was inaugurated by Jesus' death and resurrection. And then he's going up to heaven. He rules now but he will return and take his people to be with him. Just as God's people in Isaiah's day needed to be told to return and trust in the Lord. Once again so do we. To come back to him, to the king who is the wonderful counsellor, who is the mighty God, who is the everlasting father, who is the prince of peace. The promise for each of us is as we receive him, is to find light in the darkness. The invitation from him is to come to him, to come to his word, to know his promises, and to know him himself, that into our darkness, he offers us light, he offers us hope, and he offers us eternal peace. Let us turn back to our Lord, to our King who reigns over all. Let's pray. And so gracious God, we do indeed ask that in our world of darkness, you might help us to return to you as the great light. 
We thank you for the promises that you make. And that just as you have kept every promise in the past, you will continue to keep them into the future. And so we entrust ourselves and our lives into your hands once again. Lord, in the grief and in the hardship of these days, we ask that you might show us your eternal light once again. Lord, we pray that you would enable us to repent and to believe that good news. And to entrust ourselves to you, we pray. And we ask this for your name's sake. Amen. <laughs> to bring about this kingdom begins as the Lord Jesus Christ.